Hi, this is John Harcher, and welcome to episode 22 of Valleys of Numenor. We're up to episode 2 of Foundation. We've met some of the main characters and have been introduced to the main concept. An empire is destined to fall, but Harry seldom can cut down on the Dark Age from 30 centuries to around a thousand years. So they're off to set up the Foundation, but things won't go exactly as planned. Foundation Episode 2, Preparing to Live. The second episode of Foundation veers away from its source material, to put it mildly. One element of the original story has worked itself in here, but in a different context. Not sure if it's the right one or not, we'll just have to see. But there are some changes I can definitely say were not helpful to the story. The episode begins on a dwarf planet where a group of scientists are doing... Well, something to some bodies. They are soon met by Imperial troopers who kill almost everyone in sight. And the lead scientist, Quarver, is incapacitated. Demersal enters and demands she tell them who helped get their bombs to the terrorists who blew up the Star Tower. As she later tells brothers Day and Dusk, they don't know. Day states the hundreds of thousands of bodies still floating in space is bad for publicity, for lack of a better word. He also wants to blame Selden's group for it, but Demersal basically tells him it's not a good idea. Out in space, the Nostromo, I, I mean the non-jump ship, is floating towards its destination on a speedy four years and seven month trip, give or take. Gal is still counting prize, but this time in a pool on board. It makes sense for someone who grew up on a water planet. Raish is there, and suddenly it becomes a Lifetime or Hallmark movie. I know there were hints last time, but they go full into it here. She tries to get him to swim, but he does worse than the kid John Wayne tossed into the river in Hondo. Then clothes start disappearing, and you know, well, we'll leave it there. We then switch to a mining operation where a gal is there watching a group of miners get very close to a big problem. Wait, how did she get there? Is this a flashback or flash forward? Anyway. A wild animal emerges from the shadows and one of the miners shoots at it right near a gas main. Needless to say, those two things don't go together and the mine blows up. Everything disappears and we find out they're on the holodeck. Yeah, I, I mean Professor Xavier's danger room. I, I, I mean a simulation, you know, and this was their third failure. Their situation is a no-win scenario. It, huh, a test that's a no-win situation. Where, where have I heard that before? In a garden, Selden and Gal discuss a way to solve their problem and also find a way to deal with the fact that one-third of their crew would not survive five years on Terminus. Harry also wonders if the trip has demystified him a bit. While he contemplates that, Gal will go to a Foundation budget meeting. What? No trade negotiations? Back on Trantor, Brother Day confronts the Anacreon and Thespian Envoys, with the evidence they, or people sympathetic to their cause, committed the destruction of the Star Tower. Gerald acts as a devil's advocate, pointing out they really didn't know what would happen. But the Emperor is convinced of his course of action. His elder version, Dusk, is working on a giant mural, but ends up having trouble doing simple things like climbing up the ladder. Clones can't live forever. Back on board the spaceship, Gal is having a checkup to see if she can have children when she gets to Terminus, but the doctor aggressively hints someone on board isn't waiting that long. One of the engineers, Lowry, doesn't want to put her eggs in storage. She wants to have one now. She figures it's not all that different on board ship than when they get to Terminus. She reckons this ship isn't meant for living, but for preparing to live. Hey, the title of the episode. Brother Dust decides to take a trip out to where the Starbridge came down to see how the people are living. The fires are still burning and people are trying to get by, including the priest from the Seer Church. Dust wants to know from him if he's seen the future like Gal and can confirm that the Empire will indeed fall. What does begin to fall is the place around him, so Demersal gets the Emperor out of there, but not before she's struck with a rock on the shoulder. On the ship, she checks out the blood from the wound. Only it's not blood, but oil? 
Sullivan is using the prime device to see if his predictions were correct or maybe something else. Whatever he sees upsets him. He finds Gal underwater, counting primes, what else? He lets her know that she has exceeded his expectations, and he'd hoped the Foundation team would be exiled, but he never expected to be with them. So much for predictions. On her way to the meeting, she tells Rach she's sure Harry knows that they're a couple. She also lets him know that Harry's whole foundation idea isn't exactly 100% worked out. It's close, but there are a few pieces missing, and he can't seem to find them. Then Louis Perrine, head of the foundation board, interrupts him to bring her to the meeting. Maybe that wasn't a good idea. She starts asking questions on how they're deciding what will be remembered and what will be forgotten. Demersal is in her quarters and fixes herself after her injury and in front of Brother Dawn. She removes the skins and removes a piece of debris from the wires below. Yes, she's a robot. She's able to fix her skin by running a flame over the seams. He wonders why robots died. She corrects him by saying that they were destroyed by humans. After hanging out with the preserved body of the original Cleon I, Dust decides he wants to speak to the two envoys. They beg the old emperor for mercy, but he levels with them and tells them they're going to die for what they or their people have done. He even believes them that they didn't know anything about it, but the gods of vengeance must be satiated. From above, Day notices his older brother is declining. Harry Seldon decides to go down to a place where he can contemplate the issues confronting him, the laundry. He asks for his shirt back, even though they can't get a stain out. One of the women there asks him if he's happy with the Foundation's progress. He said he's sure of its success because he personally approved everyone on board and they will make it a success. He takes his still ink-stained shirt and shakes everyone's hand as he leaves. Later at lunch, Harry describes Race's first day with him and why he ended up stealing things from the library. Race snaps back at him that his father wasn't a drunk at that point, but an injured worker who couldn't get help, who then started drinking. He then storms off. Ah, awkward. Gal finds him on the holiday simulation room on the snow program. They return to the lifetime movie of the week mode. They go in a Skinamax room. I mean, geez, get a room, you two, or at least create one. Ugh. All three of the emperors discuss what to do about the renegade planets. Day wants vengeance, Dusk wants mercy, and Dawn is scared. So what to do? The envoys are brought in to part of the ruins and are unmasked to see their entire entourage standing on the edge of a building, each with a noose around their necks. Day gives a fiery speech and shows via hologram the attacks on the two planets while he pushes members off the ledge to hang. But the head envoys live to return to their worlds and tell them what happened and what will happen. Gal is swimming again, doing her primes, when suddenly she doesn't do a prime. Something's not right. She heads to Rach's uh, quarters, but he's not there. She runs to Harry's room to find Rach stabbing him to death. Mother, I mean the ship's computer, announces Harry Seldon's life functions have seats. Rach runs with Gal and puts her in an escape pod, fills it with whatever liquid they need to survive, and sends it out in space. So what the heck, Ramsey, was that all about? In the books, Harry's an old man who just dies because he's old. I have no idea why they felt the need to add such a dramatic incident. This entire episode isn't based on anything specific in the stories. It's following up on some of the trends from the first episode. The only new piece from the books introduced here was Louis Perrine, and he was someone who was around during Selver Harden's time, though serving in roughly the same function. As you can tell from my comments, there's a lot of cribbing from other sources here. The gal race relationship came on way too quickly and now ended way too quickly. This had better lead up to something. Next time, episode three, and hopefully something a little closer to the books and the main purpose of the show. Please hit the subscribe button if you like what you're listening to. I'm John Hartra. Thanks for listening.